he boarded the first ship leaving Greenland, which carried him to Denmark. Cook had already wired the New York Herald, announcing that he had reached the North Pole on April 21st, 1908. When the doctor arrived in Copenhagen, he was received as a hero. Dr. Cook was an overnight sensation. He might call him sort of the Lindbergh of his time. He was given the gold medal of the Danish Geographical Society, and he was literally showered with accolades and acclaim. At a banquet given in his honor, Cook first received word of Robert Peary's claim to the pole. He kept a very gentlemanly approach. He said, there's honor enough for both of us. So why should I object? Two records are better than one. Commander Robert Peary shared no such magnanimous feelings. He never once entertained the notion that Cook had truly reached the pole. Logistically, he reasoned, no man could have gone that far out on the ice without more supplies and men to carry them. While in Nova Scotia, Peary fired off a telegram to the New York Times. I am the only white man who has ever reached the pole. Do not trouble about Cook's story. He has simply handed the public a gold brick. Since no flag would still stand in the drifting ice of the pole to settle the issue, Cook offered his personal records to the University of Copenhagen as proof. A newspaper war erupted as accusations flew between the two camps. The race for the North Pole became a race for the hearts and minds of the public. Once again, Peary was losing. Peary fervently believed, absolutely believed, that Cook did not make it and that Cook was lying. But the American people believed initially that Cook had done it and that Peary was nothing except sour grapes. And they reacted very bitterly to Peary's... So isn't it odd that the story that they've given us about the poll, instead of talking about anything about what's there. Now the story has become about the human aspect of it, and we're focused on who got there first, when, how, and why, instead of what is there, and what did they observe. They just make it out as though they were in the middle of a gigantic blurry ice field. In one version of the North Pole, this is the mainstream version, in one version, the North Pole itself is in the middle of an ice field, in the middle of an ocean. There's no land there, and it just freezes up and you go there and stick your ice in the pole. Or, sorry, stick your flag in the pole. Distractions at, at us constantly about what the story is with the North Pole claims that Cook was a liar and a cheat. The first major blow to Cook's credibility came from an unexpected source. Ed Burrill, Cook's packer on the Mount McKinley expedition, told Peary supporters that Cook had fabricated the story of his famous ascent. Ed Burrill said that no, they hadn't actually climbed Mount McKinley at all, but they had climbed a very insignificant little peak and that he had taken his by now famous summit photograph on the top of that peak with Ed Burrill standing there holding a flag on an ice axe. Some people believe that members of the Peary Arctic Club bribed Burrill to change his story. Nonetheless, when asked by reporters to provide his original diary of the climb, Cook refused, saying, I do not see that it is material. It really did strike a big blow to Dr. Cook's credibility, and from then on, things just got more and more downhill for him. The University of Copenhagen fired the final volley. After examining papers Cook had submitted to substantiate his claim, a committee announced that nothing in the material proved he had ever been to the pole. Unfortunately, by then, Dr. Cook had vanished, and no one could ask him directly. Cook had taken refuge outside the country to ride out the storm. He soon fell from America's hero to America's disgrace. With each step of Cook's descent, Robert Peary's favor rose accordingly. Peary submitted his records to a three-man committee of the National Geographic Society. 
they announced that he had satisfied their standard of proof. Hampton's magazine paid the explorer a record $40,000 to print his story. His place in history seemed secure. Although because of his dispute with Dr. Cook, Peary was never satisfied that he had achieved the level of fame he deserved. He died February 20th, 1920, at the age of 63, and was buried with full military honors in Arlington Cemetery. The inscription, Discoverer of North Pole, marks his grave. I can't imagine his ever saying that uh, the sacrifice wasn't worth it. He did something because it was there, and he uh, showed grit and determination, creativity, durability. He was your classic American hero, and with the possible exception of Lewis and Clark, he was America's greatest explorer. Dr. Frederick Cook resurfaced a year after his disappearance, explaining that he had been suffering from no, mental again, fatigue. Cook went on strange. to defend himself in print and anywhere else he could tell his story. Two years before his death in 1940, Cook recorded this last radio interview for posterity. I have been humiliated and seriously hurt, but that doesn't matter anymore. I'm getting old, and what does matter to me is that I want you to believe that I told the truth. I state emphatically that I, Frederick A. Cook, discovered the North Pole. Was Peary indeed the first man to achieve that honor? Did the prize belong to Cook? Or should both explorers' claims... Cook, who's this well-off, hardened, experienced explorer, could have done any type of exploration and done it and proved it and used that as his motivation. Or he could have just gone ahead with his plan that he did anyways for the poll. He didn't need this McKinley trip to prove, you know, they said that he did it to prove his his uh, experience in exploration, but he didn't need to do that. And, and isn't it just odd that he would pull this scam prior to going, only to have it backfire on him later? It's such a perfectly strange situation again. The whole story is very odd. Okay, so again, here, what we have is Cook has been there. He's taken his own specific observations. And as you saw in the last little piece there, when they asked for his journal, he wouldn't provide the actual days. And he wouldn't provide the journal. He wouldn't provide the evidence to prove that he had been there. So, again, you know, had he been... Was that something he chose to do? You know, who knows if he was an independent... I don't, I don't think he was an independent explorer at this point. I think that he's already been reached by the Geographic Society, and he wants to please them. He's, you'll see this later, that he's no... He's not on the outskirts of that society, so... We know how complex these games can become, and and wouldn't it be so fitting for them to craft this story that that makes us all makes for a hundred years people are caught up in the story of the race and they completely lose sight of what was at the polls and look how easily this was done to distract people away just with a simple little story and a couple pictures and people are running on a tangent be questioned. Some modern experts believe that Peary, faced with personal failure, falsified the facts of his final five-day dash for fame and glory. They point to his sledging speeds over that period as improbable. They point to his moodiness upon his return as the product of a man preparing to perpetuate a fraud. More importantly, they offer hard evidence, two telling pages of his polar journal. There's two days that he was at the, allegedly at the North Pole. 
that there isn't anything in his diary about this. There are two blank pages. In his diary, there's a loose leaf page, separate, on different paper, on which Perry has put a date underwritten. The pole at last. I've found it, and so. Uh, very suspicious. Peary supporters, including the National Geographic Society, counter that modern photogrammetric tests measuring the angle of the sun in Peary's polar photographs prove he was no liar. Also, Peary took a series of ocean soundings that correspond to modern topographical maps, lending even more credibility to his claim. In this climate of accusation and recrimination, no clear winner emerged from the race to the North Pole. But something was clearly lost in the struggle. America's trust in its heroes. The Peary-Cook rivalry laid bare that dark side of ambition, which had driven promising men to lie, to risk lives, and ultimately, to destroy each other. All in the name of glory. Yet other enterprising men were not discouraged from new contests. At the opposite end of the earth, on the frozen crust of a sleeping continent, two men, Norwegian Ruald Amundsen and Englishman Robert Scott, prepared for a similar quest. Their target, the last great geographical prize, the South Pole. To reach it, they faced a harrowing journey. Okay, so we're gonna be in Ant Antarctica now. So, what I wanna point out to you is how the imagery that they use for Antarctica, again, the beginning imagery, which is what your mind clings to as they as they draw it in and and, and use different techniques to, to make you remember these things. So what your mind is drawn to through the first imagery is that you see mountains again. So your mind is told again that Antarctica is full of mountains and you'll remember the thing that bird did by going on TV and saying that there's warm areas in Antarctica with some sort of other side and I think that this is misleading only one of them would make it back alive naval service had long been tradition in the Scott family when Robert Falcon Scott was born on June 6th 1868. His career as a seaman was preordained. By age 30, he had risen to the rank of torpedo lieutenant, but Scott had no money or family connections to ensure further advancement. Scott felt himself to be intrinsically quite unlucky, that he had to overcome some obstacles which were always being put on in his path. And it was this sense of struggle I think which so sort of preyed on his mind at times. Scott's moodiness may have also damaged his chances for promotion. One expert believes his naval records have been censored, concealing negative evaluations of Scott's on-the-job performance. I'm morally certain that the Navy regarded him as a dud. And there is evidence that Scott was regarded as mentally unstable by the Navy and therefore, under normal conditions, would never have been allowed anywhere near the command of a ship of the line. Scott's future seemed bleak until in June of 1899, he heard that the Royal Geographical Society was organizing an Antarctic expedition. He knew its president, Sir Clements Markham, was hoping to put a British naval officer at the helm, and Scott personally applied for the job. He thought this was an opportunity which had been cast in his way. He really believed tremendously in fate. He had never, prior to this, thought of being an explorer or trying to get to the South Pole. In his own words, he said, I had no predilection for polar exploration. Gossips noted that Clements Markham seemed to prefer the company of handsome young men to women. Scott's brooding good looks and deep blue eyes, not to mention his charm, certainly